Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 3K. We're going to talk about homozygous genotypes and phenotypes in one particular gene, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator gene, which is a very big gene. It Mutations in it cause the common genetic disease cystic fibrosis. These mutations are unfortunately very common because and cystic fibrosis is a very serious genetic disease. It's a, because it's a big gene, there's many different kinds of mutations it can have, and these mutations can have different effects on phenotype. So here's a diagram of the cystic fibrosis protein, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, it's called. The red loops are parts of the protein that go back and forth through the membrane of the cell, creating a channel that chloride ions can pass through. The large red domain is a regulatory domain that controls when this chloride transport is allowed to happen. Um, this green spot here marks the site of a particularly common mutation, deletion of the codon for amino acid phenylalanine at position 508. Now, as I said, this is a very big gene. You can see here it's 180,000 base pairs long. Now, that doesn't all code for protein. Most of the gene is, in fact, introns. All of these long, thin lines represent intronic parts of the gene. Only the small vertical lines are the exons, and their thickness is proportional to their length relative to the length of the whole protein. That they're pretty small. So the next slide shows the effects of different kinds of mutations on the function of this protein. And we'll start with thinking about, well, a normal individual, no mutation produces a normal protein. The gene is transcribed into RNA. The RNA is spliced into messenger RNA. It's translated into protein, and that protein is then processed. It goes through a series of modifications in the cytoplasm before it's finally inserted into the membrane where it can function. Now, in individuals with frame shift mutations or with nonsense mutations, um, nonsense mutations create stop codons. Um, those cause premature truncation of the protein. Complete protein is not made, and as a result, there's no CFTR protein in the cell membrane. Other mutations, in particular the delta F508 mutation I mentioned on the previous slide, interfere with protein processing. The protein is synthesized normally, but the processing goes wrong, and again, there's no mature protein in the cell membrane. Other mutations that change amino acids can still allow the protein to be inserted into the membrane, but it's defective, either because it's not regulated correctly, so it's not turned on and off at the right times, or because the channel is defective and there's no transport. Finally, there can be mutations that are not in the coding sequence at all that affect splice sites. And these mutations result in too little protein being produced. Often splice site mutations are not absolute defects. Some of the time the protein will be the messenger RNA will be spliced correctly, and some of the time it won't. Again, there may be some protein in the membrane, but not enough to do the job that's needed. Now here's an even more complex diagram showing the different kinds of mutations and the locations of mutations. So these mutations, this is such a complicated diagram, I'm going to initially simplify it by hiding the mutations. So at the top of the drawing, we have all the exons. Um, all the introns have been eliminated from this diagram to save space. So we have space to actually look at the protein coding parts of the protein. Down below, we have color coded the protein to indicate the functions of different parts. So this part and this part are the membrane spanning domains. 
this part and this part bind ATP. Um, you remember this was the site of the um, delta F508 mutation. And here we have the regulatory domain. Okay, now we'll make the mutations come back. So at the top are missense mutations, mutations that change an amino acid. And you can see there's missense mutations in pretty much every exon except the very last one. These are just the mutations that had been characterized 20 years ago. With the advent of cheap DNA sequencing, I imagine that a lot more mutations have been identified now. These are the locations of amino acid deletions, and these two sets of lines are the locations of frame shift mutations and non sense mutations that completely eliminate protein production. And these are splice site mutations. You can see that just about every intron exon junction is the site of a known splice site mutation that interferes with protein function. Altogether, you can see just about everywhere in the protein, somebody has been known to have a mutation in. Now, let's just think about the one most common allele, um, the delta F508 allele, which removes three nucleotides, three base pairs from the gene, and those three base pairs correspond to the codon for the amino acid phenylalanine at position 508 of the protein. So if we think about the homozygous genotypes and phenotypes, the genotype is the DNA sequence. The normal individuals have the three bases that code for the phenylalanine codon. Individuals who are homozygous for the mutation are missing those three bases. If we think about the messenger RNA, well, both kinds of people produce the messenger RNA, but it's three nucleotides shorter in people with the mutation. If we think about the protein, whoa, suddenly we've got a great big difference. These people produce normal amounts of a normal protein. These people produce no protein at all. What about sort of organism level phenotype, health level phenotype? Well, we'll think about two phenotypes. One is fertility. It turns out that this transmembrane protein functions in many tissues. We notice the defects worst in the lung, but in fact, it's also essential for normal fertility. Production of eggs and sperm depends on functional CFTR protein. And so individuals who have defective alleles are sterile. And finally, what about lifespan? Well, lifespan is the real problem. Um, until recently, until say 50 years ago, most individuals who were homozygous for this mutation died shortly after birth, died in infancy. We, now that we understand a lot more about the, what's going wrong with the phenotype, treatments are better. Um, most individuals in Western countries where they can receive thorough, comprehensive medical treatment can live to be 30 or 40 years old although some will die earlier than that. But they do not have a normal lifespan, and they certainly don't have a normal life. So here's a question for you. This is a question where you have to work at making the connections between changes in genotype and changes in phenotype by thinking about how a particular change to a DNA sequence is going to change a protein's function. So this question asks you to consider a mutation at the same place as the delta F508 mutation we've been talking about. But instead of deleting the phenylalanine codon, this, this mutation just changes the DNA sequence so that it's a, now a tryptophan codon. How severe would you think this mutation's effect on health and lifespan would be relative to the deletion of the phenylalanine 508 codon that we discussed in the previous slide.